Eternal God, you are not confined to time or space, for you are eternal, you are sovereign, and yet you have revealed yourself by sending your son, Jesus, to a particular time, a particular place, to show us that you are present in all times and places. And so in this time and place, we ask you to be with us, for your spirit to mingle among us, to work in our hearts, to speak through the words of Tim Wardle as he helps us reflect on that time and place where you revealed yourself in a unique and decisive way so that we would know you now and for all eternity. In the name of the one in whom you reveal yourself today, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Thanks. All right. Well, it's good to be back. It's, uh, I always take it as a compliment that people come back when I speak, so, so thank you for doing so, even in the snow. So a brief um, overview or a recap of what we talked about last time. Um, last time I wanted to start talking about the political history of um, Israel and some of the important moments, kind of important people, events um, that were taking place that shaped the world of the New Testament. And we also did a little bit of an overview of um, theological beliefs. So things that all Jews believed in the first century. First century A.D. Um, and that's, these things are on your handout. So Pastor Mike asked that I kind of print up some of those dates and things and put them on a handout. So if you're, what you're getting is not for today, it's from last week. But it's a good uh, reminder of last week. Today, I want to talk about the importance of geography. <clears throat> And I want to talk about Galilee and Jerusalem and then the Jerusalem Temple. So those are our three main um, topics for the day. And I know you can't read all this. It's fine if you can't. But I wanted you to s just see this is the land of Israel. And I'm going to point out three different places. <clears throat> they're not cities. They're areas or geographical regions. So Judea is down here. Jerusalem is down here. Samaria is in the middle. And then Galilee's up north. And Galilee's actually subdivided into two different areas. Okay? In Jesus' day, Judea was Jewish. And Galilee was mostly Jewish. But Samaria was not. The Samaritans lived in Samaria. And sometimes the Samaritans got along with uh, the Jews. Sometimes they did not. It was a complicated history. Um, in fact, for a while, there had been a, a, temp a Samaritan temple in Samaria. Um, a place called Mount Gerizim. And at the same time that there was a temple in Jerusalem, and this caused some rivalry between the Samaritans and Jews, and in about the year 110 B.C., um, some of the Jews marched up to Samaria and destroyed the Samaritan temple, which did not go over very well in Samaria. So this is, that's part of the animosity between the two groups. Okay? So when Jesus and the disciples and lots of other Jews in Galilee wanted to go to Jerusalem, they very rarely went the direct route through Samaria. They almost always either went out to the coast and down and then into Ju to Jerusalem, or more likely they came down to the Jordan River, down the Jordan River to Jericho, and then up to Jerusalem. Okay, so that's some of the geography. Okay? Now, when, before we do more about geography, I have to go back to history a little bit. And again, you will not be able to read all of this. It's fine, but you can read the bolded points, probably. We, talk, we, had, we had to talk about King Herod a little bit. We talked about him last week. But his family <clears throat> was an important family. They ruled, well, King Herod ruled from 37 B.C. to 4 B.C., okay? So Jesus had to have been born before 4 B.C., which I think I said last week, um, which is not quite what we would think because it's supposed to be zero. But the guy who did the calendar a long time ago, he was really close. He was just a few years off, right? So somewhere between 6 and 4 B.C., Jesus was born because in 4, Herod died. Now, Herod's family tree is complicated, Okay? When you read your New Testament, you will see the word Herod a lot for different rulers. You're actually taught there are four different Herods that are being talked about, not just one. So when we're talking about the Herod who killed the baby boys in Bethlehem, two years old and younger, that's Herod the Great. That's really the only time he's mentioned. And then in Matthew, it says that Mary and Joseph and Jesus fled to Egypt 
to escape Herod. And then they came back a few years later, but they heard that Herod was still ruling, so they went to Nazareth instead. Herod Archelaus was ruling in Jerusalem, was one of Herod's sons. Okay, so when Herod was still ruling, that means Herod Archelaus, one of Herod's sons. They went to Nazareth where Herod Antipas was ruling, another one of Herod's sons. And this Herod Antipas is also the guy who beheaded John the Baptist. So you've got a couple different Herods. Archelaus ruled in Judea. Antipas ruled in Galilee. Okay, so that's why you hear two different names. And in the book of Acts, um, this is a lesser known story, but in Acts 13, I believe, 12 or 13, um, the, the, the action is in the city of Caesarea on the coast, on the Mediterranean coast. And it says that Herod went into the theater and all the people proclaimed him as a god and he was struck down dead. And worms came out of him. Exactly. That's Herod Agrippa. It's a different Herod. It's Herod the Great's grandson. So it's, it's just complicated when you're thinking about who's, who's who and, and where they are. Okay? So for our purposes today, we're going to care about Archelaus a bit, but really Herod Antipas is the one who matters for our purposes. Archelaus was in Judea. Antipas was in Galilee. I'll say one more bit about history, and then I'll turn the slide off. Archelaus was the successor to Herod in Jerusalem. So he got the capital city. But the Jews in Jerusalem did not like him. They did not like him at all. And so he ruled from 4 B.C. to 6 A.D. for 10 years, and then he was deposed. And enough Jews, uh, they complained to Rome that Archelaus was shipped out, and the Romans put, they, they put in direct Roman rulers, so prefects and procurators. So Pontius Pilate, that's direct Roman rule. So when Jesus is around, there are no Herods on the scene in Jerusalem, but there are Herods up in Galilee. Does this make sense? Okay. I wanted to say all that to kind of set the stage for where, what we're going to be talking about. <clears throat> so we're going to start in Galilee. This is a blow-up of, or a close-up of Galilee here. The Galilee is a region, <clears throat> and the Sea of Galilee is the most well-known part of the Galilee region. Technically, Galilee is divided into two different parts. So you can take the top of the Sea of Galilee, draw a straight line of the Mediterranean Sea. The north of it is called Upper Galilee. South of it is called Lower Galilee. There's no mention of Jesus ever going to Upper Galilee. He's always in Lower Galilee. And actually, <clears throat> Upper Galilee was exclusively Jewish. There weren't really any non-Jews in Upper Galilee, but Lower Galilee was a little more mixed population. There were some major cities... Sepphoris and Tiberias, that had a very large Gentile or non-Jewish population, but most of the villages were Jewish. There's no mention of Jesus ever going to the big cities. He always spent time in the little villages. So he's, he's among a Jewish population, but there are Gentiles and sometimes Romans around in Galilee. Okay, so here's a, a close-up of the Sea of Galilee. Capernaum is a city we're going to talk, we're going to talk more about Nazareth and Capernaum. Okay, when we're talking about Galilee. But Capernaum is here, so on the northwest side of the Sea of Galilee. Chorazin is up there. Bethsaida is here. Jesus spent a lot of time on the north side of the Sea of Galilee. And if you include a city like Magdala down here where Mary Magdalene was from, some people would say he spent about 70% of his ministry between here and here. That's a lot. That's a lot. Which is one of the reasons why I want to talk a little bit about Galilee this morning. So the distance... Between Capernaum and Bethsaida, it's maybe two and a half, three miles. It's not that far. If you put in Magdala there, it's probably about 10 miles, roughly. I'm, I'm kind of guessing, but I'm trying to think of how long it takes in a bus to get from one to the other. <laughs> it's a relatively small area, definitely. And the next slide, I think, yeah. And then we're going to stop here for a little bit. Here's Nazareth, where Jesus grew up. This is in Lower Galilee, okay? And here's Capernaum. Here. Now, I just pulled this picture from the web. It's called the Jesus Trail. You can hike this today. It's about a 40 mile hike from Nazareth to Capernaum. And you can go through a lot of the cities um, that would have been small villages in Jesus' day, including Cana, where Jesus turned water into wine. And then you get here, Mary Magdalene, Tabga. This is where Jesus' um, feeding of the 5,000 is commemorated. So there's a lot of spots along this trail where Jesus would have walked. And in Jesus' day, this is, the, this is the route you would take him. Because of the geography, you're in valleys. You know, that's why you curve around. I've never hiked this, but I think it would be fun someday. Okay, so Nazareth 
and Capernaum. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about what life would have been like in those two cities, because those are important for the life of Jesus. And then when we finish talking about some things in Galilee, then we'll turn our attention to Jerusalem and the Jerusalem temple, okay, because there's a contrast there. All of this territory here right now, well, back then, that I'm pointing to right now, was under Herod Antipas's control, okay? So King Herod's son controlled this. Now, Jesus didn't have to worry too much about Herod Antipas. He's mentioned a few times in the New Testament. But Herod Antipas, like many rulers, preferred to have more of a hands-off kind of control. It was a hands-off policy, which meant he left a lot of governmental decisions, local decisions, up to the locals. They could officiate themselves. Herod Antipas had to step in when necessary, but he was not draconian. He did not... He was not on top of everything. He didn't want to be on top of everything. In, th- in fact, he had a bunch of palaces he just liked to spend time in his swimming pool in the palace, pretty much. So, when we're talking about these areas, it is under Herod's control, and technically it's under Roman control, but there would have been very few Romans here. He, Jesus is mostly in small villages. Okay? And if you lived in a village in Jesus' day, here are some things that you would expect to find. You'd expect to find somewhere between 200 and 2,000 people in your village or town. So these are not huge places. Compare that to Zapori or Tiberias, the two big cities. There's 20,000 or so people in those cities, and those are largely non-Jewish. Those are Gentile. But the smaller villages that are Jewish, 200 to 2,000. Most of them between like 500 to 1,000. There's not a whole lot of street planning that goes on in a small village. Roads are not straight. It reminds me of Greenville a little bit. <laughs> Roads are not straight. You might have a public square that's designed, but usually the public square just happens to be where there's space. So a road goes here, a road goes here. Oh, you've got some space in the middle. Okay? Sometimes, in some villages, you have a synagogue in that public space. Nazareth, there's not been one uncovered. We don't, there probably was one. We don't know where it was. And if there was one, it was very small. Capernaum, they found it. They know where the synagogue was. And I'll show you a picture of a later synagogue on that spot. Okay? So you could expect to find um, haphazard street planning. Um, lots of people living really close together. Villages were not walled. And so, um, like Sepphoris or, or um, Tiberius, they would have walls around them. So if there was time of war, you'd run to the big city. But most people did not live in a walled city. But instead of having a wall around them, what they did is they built their houses with the outer wall facing out, or the back wall facing out, and so it was a de facto wall. It looked like a wall, but it wasn't very high. It wasn't that strong. But it was a way to kind of provide some protection. Okay? And, yeah? Was there much, I guess, would it have been a tribal warfare? Was there much of that? Not among Jews. Um, so, the an- I mean, the, it's an easier answer to give if I go back to the Old Testament. Okay, so if I'm going to give you, let me go back to an uh, earlier map. Something like, so we've got Judea, Samaria, Galilee. In Jesus' day, these are, this is mostly Jewish territory. Okay, the Samaritans are in the middle. But say in King David's time, right? The kingdom of Israel is here. The Ammonites are here, the Moabites are here, the Edomites are down here, the Philistines are over here, the Phoenicians are up here. I mean, you've just got a lot of other people around. In Jesus' day, and I'll go back to here, with the Romans in control, um, there just isn't much warfare because if you do, if you start to rise up or provoke provoke some battles, the Romans are going to step in and deal pretty heavy-handedly with you. So, no, I don't think so. Although there may have, I mean, there may well have been some bad blood between different villages or different areas, but usually you kept the peace because it would go badly with you if you didn't. Okay? By the way, you're welcome to interrupt with questions. That's actually really fun. So, thank you for your question. Uh, yes? Who and the fishermen? Yep. And his brothers and so on, they are from Capernaum, here. Okay. So when we get to Capernaum, I'll say a little bit more about that. But that, 
This is prime fishing real estate, partly because the Jordan River comes in here and there's some natural springs here, so the water's moving. And a lot of fish like that fresh water right there. Okay. So if you were in the big city, walled city, you have street planning, you've got north-south streets, east-west streets, you've got entertainment, there's sometimes big theaters, sometimes uh, gladiatorial arenas, you've got big stuff, but small villages, there's not much there. Okay? All right, I'm going to talk about Nazareth first. I don't have any pictures of Nazareth because it's very, it was very small. And there's, nothing, there's not much left of ancient Nazareth. Nazareth had about two to 300 people. It was small. So when Jesus grew up in Nazareth, he is in a small town. In John's gospel, Nathaniel, in John chapter 1, says, can anything good come from Nazareth? <laughs> like what he's, he's, this is not like a, he's not saying that Nazareth, the Nazareth people are bad people. He's just saying they're so small. How can anything good come from there? Okay? Jesus' occupation his father was a carpenter. Let's assume that Jesus was a carpenter too, right? Because the trade would pass from father to son. To be a carpenter, actually the, a better translation would be an artisan. He could do things. He could make things. There's not a lot of wood in Israel. There are tons of stones. And so most scholars will say that Jesus is actually more of a stone worker than a woodworker. Because you've got lots of raw material. Which meant... That when we have our picture, this picture in our head of Jesus kind of with a saw, cutting, shaping, maybe a lathe, you know, like really making things nice. Like that's probably not exactly what Jesus was doing. He probably did a lot more of just stonework, which is hard work. It's hauling stone. It's chiseling stone. It's making things out of stone. He would have done both, I assume. Okay? But there's lots of stone. By the way, a manger, we usually think of a... <laughs> Like in a stable, you would have like a wooden manger where the animals would come. Like it probably was stone. Jesus' manger was probably out of stone. And there are lots of examples in ancient Israel of stone mangers, meaning feeding troughs. That's what they were. Okay. If Jesus is in a town of two to three hundred, and he and his father are carpenters or artisans, where are you going to find work? I mean, there's not that much work if... A family might be 40 to 50 people. You have an extended family. So you've got maybe six, eight families at most, extended families. There's just not a lot of work to go around. But the big city, Zippori, was four miles away. And it was a build, they were building Zippori in Jesus' day. Which means that it's very likely that Jesus would have walked four miles. Jesus and Joseph would have walked four miles to go to Zippori, done some work, come back home. Now, the New, Testament, the New Testament never mentions that, which is fascinating. And there could be several reasons. It could be that Jesus didn't go. Or it could be that the, New, the gospel writers are not wanting to show that Jesus was impacted by Gentile culture. Or it could, it could be lots of other reasons, too. But it's, it seems if you're going to be a carpenter and you're going to make a, a living wage, you've got to go where there's work. So it's likely Jesus went to the big city to help build houses or things like that there. But Nazareth was small, very small. Capernaum, on the other hand, was bigger. So here, this is modern day, but this is the lakefront of Capernaum. So this is the Sea of Galilee here. And then it goes, obviously, the landscape goes up from there. And this part right here, there's a few modern buildings there, but this is ancient Capernaum. Now in Nazareth, this modern city of Nazareth is built right on top of ancient Nazareth, so you, we can't really find much. But here, after couple hundred more years, this city was never built on top of, and so you can find things. You can see what life would have, might have been like at Capernaum. So here's an aerial view, and it's this part right here, the parts that's been, that, this has been excavated, okay? So you can see some of these, um, maybe you can't see it, I can see it, but it's a lot farther away from you. Um, I'm going to show you some pictures of this part. All of these stones here would have been houses all throughout here. Okay? And this right here is the edge of the public building. So this is the synagogue at Capernaum. This is a massive synagogue. It's not from Jesus' day. This is from the 4th or 5th century A.D. But this picture is a little grainy, but it does a good job of showing this. On top of this 
limestone synagogue, there's a basalt rock foundation. And that stems from the first century. So Jesus' synagogue would have been in the same spot as the synagogue, but they leveled the old synagogue and rebuilt it. Kind of like, you know, get enough people, you have a new building campaign, build a new church, same kind of thing. Okay? And this is what a typical home may have looked like. So an entrance, I'm going to go to this one over here. And this is a, this is a good size home in Capernaum. You have the entrance. So the outer part is walled around your house. Okay, now we have this idea that we have our house in the middle of our property, but then we have lawn around and kind of a nice view coming up. That was not the ancient way of thinking about houses. Houses were protection. And so whatever property you had, you built right on that property line, and then you had an inside middle, an inside area where people could do things. So cooking would often happen in this middle area. And there, it might have been, say it might have been here, but there's an, it's open air, so the smoke can come out. Kids could play in here. You could house your animals in here. It was just kind of the free-for-all. This is the, really the living room, right, or the family room. Everyone's here. And then you would break off, and you, you could go to your various, various rooms. Now, when we think of various rooms, we might think of, I mean, I have three daughters, so this one might be Autumn's room and Aspen's room and Brooke's room, and then Sherry and I would be here, something like that. That's not how it worked in the ancient world. You would have family units living in each of these, usually. So, well, here's an example. Let's say that I am living at my parents' house, and I've decided that I'm ready to marry Sherry. That would mean in the ancient world, Sherry's about 14 or 15, and I'm mid-20s. Okay? I am not going to go build a new house somewhere over here. What I am going to do is build an addition, maybe this room right here, to my father's house. And then when Sherry and I get married, we move into my father's house. And that's why houses keep growing a little bit, because you get more family units in the house. Okay? So which means I have three daughters. My three daughters would go and live with their husband's father's house. That's where they would live. Okay? They wouldn't live in my house. But, that's, but it, you can see this, too. This is kind of haphazard. It's not well-planned. You just kind of, okay, we need another, build, another room, another building, so we just build onto it. Okay? But this is, this is life in ancient Capernaum. Now, industry-wise, fishing was a big thing in Capernaum, but so was um, uh, harvesting olives and harvesting dates, those two things, but especially olives. And they found olive presses um, in Capernaum. So uh, we know that they were, they were using them. This, I don't know if they really know it's a wine cellar or not, but they're just trying to give you a sense of what, what a room may have looked like. Okay, I don't want to go there yet. Let's go back to here. So Capernaum. And this goes to your question before about who was there. Okay? There's so much that up in Capernaum that I had to write it down. All right. A number of Jesus' miracles happened in Capernaum. I'm just going to list a few for you. A number of activities and miracles. So first, this seems to have been the hometown of Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Capernaum was their hometown, and maybe Matthew. Because Matthew was called as a disciple while he was at a tax booth in Capernaum. Okay. Jesus may well have had a home in Capernaum. It may have been an extension off of Peter's house or someone else's house. We don't know for sure. But this was home base for sure. At a certain point in time, Jesus leaves Nazareth and he moves to Capernaum. And then a lot of his ministry is right around there. And most people assume that he actually had some sort of a residence there. But we we couldn't tell you which which house, which place. Um, In just in Mark's just in Mark one tells you that Capernaum was the hometown of Peter, Andrew, James and John. It tells you that Jesus is preaching tells you about Jesus preaching at an exorcism or casting out of a demon in Capernaum, in the synagogue. It tells you that Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law. That's all just in Mark 1. In Mark 2, Jesus um, has a, calls a tax collector and calls him to follow him, so this is probably Matthew. Um, Jesus heals a paralytic in Capernaum. And another, one of the more famous stories, partly because of the synagogue here, is Later on in Matthew, uh, Matthew tells you that there was a Gentile centurion, so a Gentile Roman army officer. He didn't have to be Roman. He just had to be part of the Roman army. He was probably Syrian or something like that. 
okay, because he was, probably wasn't from Rome itself. And he had a servant who was sick. So he comes to Jesus and asks Jesus if he can heal him. And then he says, but you don't have to actually come into my house and do it. You can just say the word and my servant will be healed because I know how that works. I command people when I say something, they go do it. You seem to be a powerful person. Just say the word and the servant will be healed. And so the servant is. But it's fascinating what the people in Capernaum say about the centurion. What they say to Jesus is, you should heal this guy's servant because he has paid for our synagogue and he's a really good man. So the first century synagogue in Capernaum was probably paid for, mostly. Like his name would have been on the outside, right? The, the, the big gift would have been from the Roman centurion, <laughs> which is interesting, yeah? All right, one other thing about Capernaum. I'm going to go to this map. Nazareth is in the middle of nowhere. There is not on any trade routes at all. But Capernaum is... There is a major trade route. It comes kind of this side of the Jordan River, crosses, comes here, goes down, and then cuts in this way. So when it says that Matthew is a tax collector, the reason he's there is because people are moving through here. People from up in Damascus, they're coming down, and they want to, maybe they want to get to Egypt. Well, this is one of the focal points where you come through. So he's, not, he's probably not taxing fellow Jews. He's taxing traders. He's taxing people who are coming through. So Capernaum was just a little more, more important of a town. And it had an industry. It had fishing industry. It had an olive industry. Okay? But again, even at, I, didn't, I don't think I gave you a number, about 1,000 to 2,000 people lived in Capernaum. Okay? So it's bigger than Nazareth. A little more important than Nazareth. But still, it's not a big city. Okay? I want to compare that to Jerusalem, which is where we're going next. Okay. This is a modern picture of Jerusalem. And this is the, kind of the most famous image in Jerusalem today. It's the Dome of the Rock. It's a Muslim site. This, where, the, where the Dome of the Rock is located is most like where the Jerusalem temple stood. So when, when the, the temple in Jesus' day, the temple in Solomon's day before that, that was built right on the spot here where the Dome of the Rock now stands. But what I want to focus on more than that, right now at least, is this rectangle. It goes like this, comes like this, and then comes this way, and then back like this. It's a huge rectangle. This is sometimes called the Temple Mount. That's what people call it. And King Herod built it. Herod the Great. So the first Herod. Herod wanted, Herod wanted to make a name for himself in lots of ways. I told you last week that he built a lot of things. This is the most impressive thing that he built. He built this huge platform where you could put the temple. So on top of this huge rectangular thing, then you put a smaller temple right on top. Okay? So this whole thing is not the temple. The temple would have been right here, but then you have the temple platform or the temple mount. And I'm emphasizing this um, because a, <clears throat> a lot of people get these things confused. But this is the temple mount. The mount, the platform that Herod built, that still stands today. Herod's platform still stands, which is pretty phenomenal, 2,000 years later. Some of the... Um, <clears throat> you know, I did the math on it once because I, the, the figures are so... They vary so broadly. I have heard anywhere from four football fields in size to 24 football fields in size, which doesn't make any sense. When I did it, it came to like 16 or 18 football fields. But it's big. It's a big platform. And uh, I used to have the acres, but I can't remember how many acres it is now. But it's a, it's a large, it's a large platform. And this is not natural. So right on top of it, right underneath here is a rock so that the hill would have come up like this. And what Herod did is he leveled the whole thing, which means there's a lot of artificial fill right in here. So especially on this end, um, it's probably 60 feet at least of just fill. And then there's a wall. And the weight would have... I could spend too much time talking about this platform. So I'll say one more thing and then I'll move on. <laughs> Underneath, this part is the part that he had to fill the most because the topography was such that it dropped off so steeply, so sharply, that if he just filled it solid, the weight would have been so heavy that it would have pushed the walls out and the thing would have collapsed. So what he did is he, there's a series of arches underneath there. So it's empty except for these huge vaults, the vaulted arches. 
um, that still are there today. It's actually part of the Dome of the part of the Al Aqsa Mosque. This mosque, they have an underground section of the mosque, and it's part of those arch, those arches are where they pray now. That's right. That's right, because it would have been too much pressure. The weight would have been so, so immense that it would have just pushed the walls out. That these walls still stand today is a testament to how well he could build. There's no cement in these stones. They were cut to fit and then dropped right in place. Some, the biggest of them weigh 560 tons, I think. Massive stones, right? And partly because those stones are so massive, they're not moving, Right? So there's a, there's a master row of stones that are huge, and then there's smaller ones on top of that. Okay. So someone asked me last week about the Western Wall or the Wailing Wall. Someone over there. They may or may not be here today. The Western Wall or the Wailing Wall is not the wall of the temple itself. It's the wall of the temple platform or the temple mount. So the Western Wall, I'll show you a picture of it. The Western Wall is right here on the other side. Okay? So I'll show you in a minute. But the, when people think about the Jews praying at the Western Wall, sometimes people have in their mind that it was the wall, Western Wall of the Temple itself, and it's not. It's the Western Wall of the Temple Mount, or the Temple Platform. All right. So this is modern day. In Jesus' day, this is a model of what the Temple would have looked like. If you were to go to the Israel Museum today, they've done a replica. It's a 50-to-1 model. So it's, this is an exact replica of what they think the city of Jerusalem looked like. So here is the temple mount area, and this is the temple in it. And then these would have been the walls around the city. Okay, and I'm going to show you one other picture so you can see the temple itself here. And then the city spread out. This lower part here, it's called the lower city. Um, I, I don't want to presume too much about your economic status, but at least I would be living in the lower city. If you were wealthy, you'd live in the upper city right up here. And the priests lived in the upper city. Not all of them, but the high priest did for sure. So this was more densely populated. This, there was more villas and stuff. And then Herod's palace would have been right here. Okay, But, but what I want you to see here is that how much the temple dominated the skyline of Jerusalem. Okay? So a few words about, about Jerusalem, and then we're going to talk about the temple. Some Gentile writers, some non-Jewish writers, when they talked about the Jewish temple, or they talked about the city of Jerusalem, they said it was the most famous city in the east. Jerusalem is not on any trade routes at all. So it's not important in terms of trade, in terms of economy, which is why most big cities are right on trade routes in the ancient world. What seems to have made the temple, or what made the city most important is the temple. The Jerusalem temple drew Jews from all over the world to come on pilgrimage to Jerusalem. So they would leave behind houses, occupations for a week, two weeks, maybe three weeks, and they would come, especially at a festival called Passover, in order to come to the temple where God lived, where God was thought to dwell in a special way. Jews knew God God lived everywhere. He wasn't confined to one spot. But God had said that his presence would be here in this special spot in a special way. And so Jews would come. Okay? Local Jews would come more often. If you lived in Rome or Athens or in Persia somewhere, you might come once in your lifetime. But it was seen as something that you wanted to do. So you would come to Jerusalem for religious reasons, if you were Jewish. And some Gentiles would come just to see what the Jews were doing. But Jerusalem was not important, it was not important only because of its religious status. It was also an economic center. Because of pilgrimage, really, Tons of money flowed into Jerusalem. And in fact, the temple itself functioned, or at least this area functioned as a bank. So much money came in, and it was seen as such a holy place that it was thought invaders wouldn't come or robbers wouldn't try and come into the temple and steal things, that not only did did people give money to the temple, but also people had deposited money in the temple. And and then that could, a few years later, they could come and get their money out, kind of like we have a bank today. Jerusalem was not the only temple in the world that did that. There were other temp- major temples in the ancient world, sometimes functioned as banks, but Jerusalem was one of them. And here's another indication of how much wealth was here, is every male Jew between the years of t- ages of 20 and 50 were required to pay a temple tax. It didn't matter where you lived in the Roman world. It was a half shekel, so like a half a day's wage is how much you're supposed to pay. 
But if you've got every male Jew between the ages of 20 and 50 giving this every year, you're getting a lot of money in the temple. Now, it was supposed to be for the upkeep of the temple. It's expensive to run a temple. You've got water coming in. You've got animals that have to be sacrificed. You've got wood to buy for the sacrifice. You've got all sorts of things that you have to pay for. But it was a wealthy place, a very wealthy place, um, which made it a target for some foreign kings from time to time because they knew it was a wealthy place. Yes. From becoming what? I don't... I'm going to go all the way back to this, which you can't really see very well, but I'll, I'll show you. There, was, there were two main trade routes. Damascus is up here. Egypt is going to be down over here. Right? And these were two major cities that if you wanted to move goods, I mean, you wanted to go between these two cities. If you're in Rome or something way over here, you could ship, but you usually want to come around and down to Egypt. Or if you live all the way over here and say Babylon, you've got to go up over the desert through Damascus and then down. Right? So Damascus was really important, and Egypt was known as a fertile place, and so people wanted to get there. The trade routes. In Jesus' day, it would have come down here, come like this, and then if you've heard of the city of Megiddo, where we actually where we get the term Armageddon from in Revelation, there's the valley of Armageddon here. But Megiddo was one of the most important cities in the ancient world because it was on this major trade route. It would come down like this, you'd cross the mountains here, you'd go down to the coast, and you'd go down to Egypt. So Jerusalem is inland, it's right here. It's in the hills, so it's just harder to get to. The other major trade route just went on this side of the Jordan River, this side of the Dead Sea and down. It's called the King's Highway. You've got the Coastal Highway, the King's Highway. Jerusalem's in neither one. But what brought people there was the temple. That's why, that's why people would come. Does that answer your question? Okay, yes. Mm-hmm. I'm going to come to this side of the map for this. Caesarea is right here. It's on one of the major trade routes. Okay? It's called Caesarea because King Herod built it in honor of the Caesar, in honor of the emperor. So Caesar Augustus was the emperor, and he named it in honor of Caesar. It's one of those building projects that Herod did that no one really knows exactly how he knew how to do it in his day. Because what he did is he... I showed a picture last time, but he built a harbor out into the Mediterranean Sea, and no one had actually done anything quite like this before. The reason he did it it's partly because the trade route would come through here so we could tap into that trade route, but also because if you want to um, be an important economic hub, you need a port. There were ports up there. There were ports in Egypt, but there was nothing because there's no natural harbor along here. And so he built a port so that ships could come in and out, which made Herod a wealthy person for sure. Does that kind of answer your question? Um, there are a few Caesarea, so you usually have to label them. Caesarea Maritima or Caesarea by the sea. Caesarea Philippi is up here, and Jesus went to Caesarea Philippi once, so that's a different story. Okay, back to Jerusalem. Okay, the city. Here's a picture of the Western Wall today. So I like this because it can show you the Jerusalem Temple would have been right here where the Dome of the Rock is, this is the western wall. So it's the western wall of the Temple Mount. Okay? And these are men, these are women. So this is actually an active synagogue, and it's an orthodox synagogue, so men and women are segregated today in terms of uh, praying at the wall. So this part of Herod's platform still remains. I think I've got, yeah, one, one more here. What you saw in that picture, this bit here, is this bit here. Herod's Temple Mount was 17 stories below ground, modern day below ground. All right, so I'm going to go back and show you. Herod's platform went to about here, and the Romans then knocked off a few upper layers, so they've been reconstructed. Herod's Temple pro- or platform probably went to about here. But think 17 more stories down, that's ground level. That's how big this platform was. It was huge. All right, before we run out of time, I am going to show you 
something fun. Okay, so some really smart people. Can you see? You can't see it. Shoot. All right, I got to think about how to do this. I have to reverse the screen. Well, I might not be able to show you. Too much pressure. <laughs> so what I'll do is I'll use this model instead. I got to got to get back to it. Okay, you can see that, right? All right. What I was going to show you is like a virtual reality model of the temple. It's pretty cool, but I'll try and figure it out later. All right. I just want to explain a little bit more about this temple here. This size, so this is the temple in Jesus' day. So if Jesus, coming, if Jesus is coming from Galilee, he spent most of his time in Galilee. According to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, he only came to Jerusalem really once when, as an adult. And that was during the last week of his life. If you're in the Gospel of John, he comes a number of times. So it's, there's differences between the Gospels in terms of how many times he came to Jerusalem. But if you were coming to Jerusalem, you would come in from, you'd probably come from Jericho. So you'd kind of come down the Jordan River, you'd come up. And this would have been the first things you see when you get to Jerusalem. These temple steps here, which you can kind of see, um, would have been the main entrance into the, into the temple itself. So you'd enter underground, actually, and you'd come up in these spots right here. So you'd kind of emerge in the middle of the temple platform. On a festival like Passover, the city of Jerusalem had maybe 200,000 residents, and it would double in size at Passover. So at most, you've got 500,000 people in Jerusalem at Passover. That is a ton of people. And all of them were coming to come into this area right here. That's why you would come to Jerusalem. So if Jesus is coming, he would walk up through these steps, if any Jew is coming, but we'll use Jesus as an example, come up through these steps, emerge here, and you would mill around in these outer courtyards. Sometimes it's called the Court of the Gentiles or the Court of the Nations. Because Jews and Gentiles both could be in this part. But there was a, a wall about here and about here that said, no foreigner or alien can go beyond this point upon pain of death. And only, only Jews could go past that barrier and into the temple itself. And then there were actually um, the different courtyards that only... You could only go so far depending on who you are in terms of whether you're Jewish or not or whether you're female or male or whether you're a priest or not. So court of the Gentiles here. Court of the women is here. So Jewish men and women could be here. Farther in is the court of the, of the Israelites. So that's the court of the men. And then farther in, it's only for the priests. And then only the high priest can go into the temple itself and only once a year. So this is, it was a holy place. And you knew where you were vis-a-vis... Judaism, whether you were Jew or not, because how far you could go. You knew um, gender-wise how far you could go. Then you knew occupation-wise in the sense if you were a priest or not how far you go. And then you, only the high priest could go all the way in. And the idea is you can't rush into God's presence at all. That's probably these steps, too. They were, they were done like these steps here. They're equal size. I could run up these stairs. I might trip and fall, but I could run up the stairs. The ones going up into the temple, though, they are long, short, long, short, long, short. And were, that was on purpose so that you can't run into the presence of God. It breaks your stride as you're going in. So you're supposed to go in slowly, reverently. But on Passover, you're with tens of thousands of other people. So you would have been bumping shoulder to shoulder with people. You were bringing your sacrifice. You were going in to sacrifice this animal to the God of Israel in order to have your sins forgiven. Now, there were a bunch of different sacrifices that you could make. You could make a sin offering, which is what Jews would do. You could also make a thank offering. If God had been particularly good for you, good to you, you could make a thank offering. Um, sometimes it's an animal. Sometimes this is grain. If you had a great harvest, you could come in and bring grain. There are about four or five different sacrifices that you could give for different reasons. One of them is called, the, the most serious one is called the Holocaust offering or the burnt offering. That's where we get the word Holocaust from because you kill the entire animal. You burn it. You burn the entire animal. The priest had a big job. If you've got really hundreds of thousands of people coming in a week, think about what a priest's life would have been like. They called all the priests in from all over the country, 
Right? You all hands on deck because you have to have a lot of people. And in the ancient world, priests were really professional butchers. They knew how to kill an animal quickly, the proper way, to offer whatever needs to be offered as a burnt offering, to give the rest of the meat back to the, to the person. Because unless it's a Holocaust offering, you don't burn the whole animal. You give some of the meat back to the person, and then they go and they can eat the meat. At Passover specifically, you would sacrifice an animal in the temple. The priest would get a little bit, and then you would get your lamb back, so then you could have your Passover meal that night. Right? So especially at Passover, the priests have to be very efficient in what they're doing. So when Jesus comes into the temple, and he... It, actually, it never says that he offers a Passover sacrifice, but he does have a meal that night. So most people assume that he sent some of his disciples into the temple to offer the animal and then bring it back for the Passover meal. Okay? I'm almost done. I want to give you one more thought. As I'm just ta- I've been talking about the temple a lot. The temple was really important in Judaism. It was the center of Jewish religious life. Paul. Paul starts using the temple in a very interesting way. So Paul's writing the Corinthian letters while the temple's still standing. He's in the Gentile where he's not in Jerusalem. But he starts saying things like this. What agreement is the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Or in Second Corinthians, or in 1 Corinthians 6. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and that you are not your own? When Paul is starting to talk about the Christian community and non-Jews, Gentile Christians, as the temple of the living God, what is he doing, do you think? That can be a rhetorical question. <laughs> so it could be, right? And there, there's not one way that people understand this. Okay, So some people would say, Paul is actively saying, we're the temple and that place is not, right? That place where people are offering animals as sacrifices, no longer necessary, not important. Now the action is here in the Christian community. That's one way to think about it. But another way to think about it too is, if you want your temple to be an important place, you kind of need the other temple to also be important, right? Say, that's important. God is there, but God is also here. God is also in our midst, right? But if he's saying this to Gentiles and not to Jews, he's making a really, really bold claim. It's not just that God is the God of the Jewish people, because in Judaism, God is the Jewish God. He's the God of Israel, and only Jews could go into the temple and sacrifice. When Paul takes a step back and says, you Gentiles are also a temple of the living God, that is a very bold statement. He's also breaking down gender designations because men and women in the Gentile church, they are both part of the temple, important parts of the temple. In the Jerusalem temple, only the men could go in at the very end, and then only the priests could go in, and those distinctions are kind of broken down. It's not just Paul. Peter is saying the same thing. Come to him, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight, and like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And it's not just Peter. I don't have any more slides. But this is an idea that Christians are starting to transfer some Jewish ideas into the Christian community and say, that was, that was good for a time, and now God is expanding his work in the world, and now Gentiles are part of this, and now we are a temple, is one metaphor that they will use in a fascinating way. There's a very... A provocative way to talk about it as well, while the temple's still standing. Right? Okay, my time is up. Do you have any questions or thoughts? Yes. Great question, and the answer is both. You could bring it. Every anyone could bring a lamb, but if you're going to go for a, a multiple day walk or maybe you're coming on a boat, that lamb has to be unblemished. It has to be in perfect condition for it to be a sacrifice. What if you get it all the way there and then it stumbles and breaks its leg? It's, it's no longer fit for sacrifice. So most people, unless they live locally, most people just brought money and they bought a lamb when they got to the temple and then used that, which meant there was a huge enterprise. of You had to have 
rams, goats, lambs, birds, things. And then when Jesus, when Jesus goes into the temple and gets angry and knocks over tables, something is going on there. Maybe people are charging too much or something. So Jesus gets upset at some of that industry. Not that it, people, people needed a lamb. It, most people think it was happening, this is pillared all the way around, in this pillared area. So you'd come up here, turn around, get your lamb, and go in. All right, so it could have been here, or it could have been just outside on the stairs, somewhere like that. Yeah, and it's not, it's not very, um, the aroma is not very pleasant either, right? Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. It was. But which is also why you needed lots of water to wash out the place. And that was another thing that Herod did is he built aqueducts coming into the temple so they had plenty of water to clean the place out. Was one sacrifice, one animal sacrifice uh, looked um, more favorable than the other? Or were they all equally? They were for different purposes. Right? So there was a sin offering. <clears throat> there was a Thanksgiving offering. And I'm for, there, I can remember the Hebrew name for some of these. I can't remember the English. I just can't remember the distinctions. This is, I can't remember the Hebrew term. I can't remember what it means. It's terrible. But then there are about four or five different sacrifices that you could make. <clears throat> but the most common were the thank offering and the sin offering. It's all in Leviticus. It's all in Leviticus. That's right. <clears throat> Any other thoughts or questions? All right. I've taken up too much of your time. So thank you very much.